Hi, everybody. What'd you think of the episode? Uh, I'm Ben Travers. I'm IndieWire's TV critic, uh, and I'm very, very excited to be here. Better Things has been one of my favorite shows since it debuted. Um, I love everybody on it, uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, first and foremost, let's bring up the casting director and season three consulting producer, Felicia Fasano. Um, and then this this person, I believe, needs no introduction, and yet they have uh, an unending list of credits. So creator, showrunner, writer, director, executive producer, and star, and probably something I'm forgetting, none other than Pamela Adlon. Hello. Is this clean? I don't have an issue or anything. <laughs> Hi, target audience. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think you chose a pretty good episode for this crew. I think that's uh, right on point. Yeah, I love it. This one is my love letter to our kind, to actors. It really is. Well, I mean, how did it uh, how did it get started? Because this was obviously written by Sarah Gubbins, but um, you know, it's part of the season. It's, it envelops so many of the season themes. Um, but where did it come from? Where did the idea spark from to go off and kind of do this play? Well, I had done. This is so fun to tell you guys because you guys will get all of it. Okay, so I did a play reading at the Roundabout a year before with Matthew Broderick. And so it was like, it was amazing. We had an amazing guy. It was like Grant Showed, who's hilarious, Laura Benanti, Matthew, some other Jews, and Lonnie Price <laughs> directed it. So um, it was amazing. Like, the whole thing was very cinematic to me. You know, uh, Penny Fuller was in it. You know, lots of fabulous people. It was just so cool. And so, like, we got our $50 bills from Equity, and they were crispy, and and all of that stuff. And I wanted to do it. And um, we, of course, I didn't get to go to the Friars Club, to the roundabout, to do uh, to New York. So I had to make up a town, call it Hamletville. <laughs> and then Felicia and I were talking about it. We're like, we have to get Matthew for this part. It's written for him. Like he even, on the day we did the play reading, he did the one word Lithgow impression, butterfly. And so, so Fleet, you should tell the part about calling Matthew Broderick's agent. Come on, inside scoop, <laughs> actors. Give him some candy. Well, at some point during the process of the season, we also had the part of the therapist. So that ended up through a whole... Well, that's... Well, I was going to oh. say... You, I was going to tell the... I want you to tell the bad story about agents and oh, why they're about bad. about how when we told them how much money we had, they almost hung up on me. They were but like, we're, no. he's not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. then... It was Flea's bril brilliant idea. So we put out a thing for David Miller, the therapist that Sam goes to. And Flea's like, um, what about Matthew for David Miller? And um, so, I mean, somehow it worked out. And then Mark Feuerstein was like, da 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 <laughs> Mark, had, his manager had called us before he started the season and said, He's obsessed with the show. He wants to be on it. So every time something came up, it was like, Feuerstein? 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 And finally, we're like, we got a part for Feuerstein. Let's get him in. He was so happy. Yeah, it was great. Well, with, with Mark, before we just jump off topic really quick, I do want to know the origins of the nine JKL joke. Was that his idea? Was that your idea? Because that was an inside. Okay, so the way I work in the world of the show is that the play... And it was, it, it's very difficult. This is where Sarah Gubbins was so brilliant. I was like, you have to write a mediocre play. <laughs> because we're all looking going, is this a good? Are we gonna? And then after we're like, oh yeah, this is the one, man. So she wrote that. But then when we got to, we shot this at the Actors Gang in Culver City. 
And uh, when we got there, I, you know, I had all these wonderful actors and I said, we need more. So I, I put Norm with John John and then I put Holland with Norm and then I put Gabrielle with Holland and I just kept mixing it up. And I said, let's just fuck around and, and put words here and whatever. So that's all unscripted. And... Wait, 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 you're talking about the, like the scenes where they're up there kind of in between takes or when they're... No, it's... Um, Dur- during the reading. During the reading, it's unscripted. So yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, you know when she's when you're like crying and Holland's like, it's been thirty years, and and at one point I said, who wants to cry? And Gabrielle's like, right here, bitch. And that's when she was like, his whole life is clamping down. So that was all. <laughs> Unscript. That was just like fucking around as actors. And it was amazing because it was just the perfect blend. And then the record store, that's just found comedy because we were at this record store and we found this Negro Spirituals album. And I was like, oh, fuck. And then I said, I have to find something Jewish. And then I found Fiddler on the Roof. So then the 9JKL thing came out because... We're walking out, and I said, you guys talk about stuff. And then they finished, and I was like, what were you saying? I fell asleep. That was the most fucking boring thing in the world. And they were like, what do you want us to say? I said, talk about your failed show. (laughs) And so he was like, oh, good. Oh, yeah, because the first thing, Feuerstein's like, anyway, I have a daughter, Lily, and she likes to play piano. And I was like, no, bro, no. So I said, talk about your failed, and it was just the perfect timing because he got right to the camera, and John John goes, what was it called? He's like, 9JKL. <laughs> so. Then John John made that face and, and immortal. But the, um, but the last thing about this, excuse me, that's the most important, I, this was written for New York City, the Friars Club, the roundabout, Marie's Crisis Cafe, which, do you guys know it? Okay gay piano bar in the village. The song On the Street Where You Live was a must for me and Norm Lewis. This was all in my head. This was my fantasy. This was my crack. I have loved Norm Lewis since I saw him in Miss Saigon on Broadway in the original production. And it's coming here now, so you guys fucking should go see it. He's not going to be in it, but... So I've loved him and I have, I have wanted to meet him and all of my New York Broadway friends know him, wrote this part for him with this moment, got the song, and that was the one thing that my network let me do, fly Norm in for this, so. Well, I mean, it, it obviously worked beautifully because like the, the end of that episode is so emotional and so powerful and I, I love how it comes about. But before we get all the way to that point, Felicia, I did want to ask just, I mean, this was something that was, like you mentioned, was always designed with kind of theater actors in mind. Like you were hoping to bring them in, but also like everything you're talking about requires so much from a performer. There's, improvi- there's improvised lines, there's uh, a lot of emoting, there's a lot of kind of opportunity to be found within the moments that they're going through. How did you go about finding the rest of the cast? Like how did you go about looking for them and, and knowing they'd be able to pull it off? Well, it was a longer process because we knew that we were going to shoot this at the end of the schedule. So over the time, because we cross-board all 12 episodes, which if you guys are familiar with that. So we knew we had time to figure out who was going to be in New York at the end. So occasionally people would come up. Holland Taylor was somebody we thought about for Sharon Stone's part. And um, Norm, we always knew we were going to try to get him. And as we went along, it was just people... It was like a combination of She would call me and say, what about Gabrielle Ruiz? And I'm like, who? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and John John. I mean, this, was, this episode is such a good collab between me and Fleet. Like everything. Like, you know, we've been working together since Californication. Flea cast me in Californication. And uh, I used to armchair cast with her at night. We used to text and I'd be like, no, don't hire that bitch. Hire this bitch. (laughs) (laughs) You got to be real. We're actors. I'm with my kind. 
I think also there's a bit of luck with it also when you know when you get closer to the schedule and you know exactly when you're shooting there's certain people we did try to get that were not available and then John John just like happened to be available the day that we were shooting it and um, Gabrielle was here I was, had worked with her on something else before and then we got Jimmy Smagula to play the piano oh yeah when he, now he's At, doing because Mimis. Flea knows Jimmy because they're like an Italian, Italian organization <laughs> True. And they all oh, fucking everybody. make Zeppelis like once a year with Jimmy Kimmel or something. I don't know. I think so. That's how you find me. <laughs> right, well, I, I definitely want to hear more about that. So like we're gonna come back, come back to that too. But um, what is it? What is it though that for you like really sets somebody apart and lets you know that they'll fit in better things? Because we talked before, and it's like you'll see a, you'll see an actor when you're doing you know other auditions for other projects, and you'll put that kind of in the back of your mind like, oh, that that person could work here. I, I want to come back to them and pitch them to Pam, but what what is it about, you know, people that kind of stand out to you when you are thinking in that better things mode? It's voices, always. There's something about a voice that's interesting and special. It's a look that's really different and very real. Of course, it's good acting. It's not necessarily somebody who's like super comedic, but more, they can just be really real. And the thing about our show, which is different than anything else I've ever cast, is that we don't we do all cold readings so if i can see somebody's really quick on their feet like they can change it i can give the material really fast that's somebody that'll work on our show yeah um you know that for me it's always the voice you know the voice is what attracts me and uh it it's a, a it's a style of comedy that's not pushed so it's not coming at you it's sitting back and inviting you into it if that makes any sense and then do you guys like when you when you had those ideas like for this episode in particular like when you thought of Gabrielle and you're you know talking it over with you like do you do you show her a video do you send her like the tape like how does that kind of discussion she sometimes she, she will read. text me all the time and be like you know so and so so and so and I'm like that person's dead to me if you say their name one more fucking time and then they I end mean. up in the show <laughs> Timing. It's you guys timing. get up her asshole because <laughs> it will somehow. Uh. Gabrielle put herself on tape and she didn't even know the words to um, for My Fair Lady. We she had to like learn the words for the song. We had her sing because there was no real oh, material. Yeah. I just wanted her to sing for you. And Jimmy put himself on tape playing the piano and singing. But everyone else was purely an off. Here's here's a good thing about about the actors. It's like will see somebody and flea knows me by now and we have a thing what's our way of doing it you see you get the people you're in the session or you see the tape and do you tell me who you like no never <laughs> i'm not allowed i have to i have to wait because it's I, a I, fun I, I, game i forget and i say it and then i'm like shit i should have never said it but then so every once in a while there'll just be one person who's it and i'll just be like this is the person i'm only sending you this one person because this is exactly what you want this is very specific person you know uh people have come in for parts that are so um different than they than they would usually get submitted for and then flee like there's this girl hollis what's hollis's last name Fuck. She's very memorable. Andrews. Andrews. Oh, yeah. Alice Andrews. Um, but she's amazing. And she came in for one part. And we were like, what's for Hollis? What's for Hollis? That scene got cut. Next season, she came in for another part. What's for Hollis? What's for Hollis? We cast her. That scene got cut. <laughs> she's yet to be in. But she's been amazing. Like, there's people that we know and remember. Is that Quete? What's up? I was going to point him out to you. <laughs> oh my God, it's Quinte. That's my accountant on the show. <laughs> Season one. Hi, Quinte. Amazing. Cool. That happened. Also, Alan Smith, who plays uh, Mook in, the, in this episode, he was somebody that was wait, in, wait. he was in season one and got cut out. And well, we were you see for him play, for right? a second. <laughs> The camera rolls by his face for a second. 
Well, and Felicia, you've been on the show too as well, right? Like you've actually been yes. like set in as a casting director in certain scenes. Is that I'm a just really not speaking? awful casting director. She, Much she's like in, in the life. pilot. Yeah, so I'm in the pilot. Yeah, playing the mute. Casting in the constant director. simmer scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, do I need to go now? Yeah. I would never take a job away from an actor. What are you so writing? Never have lines. Is it good? <laughs> good. Voice. She's getting the tips. This is what, Get this her is what they're here for. I like her. She's taking notes. <laughs> well, getting back oh, to getting back to the specific episode, I am curious about the like the specific dialogue that you chose for the actors in between takes and what they were saying like toward the director and, and toward the writer and and stuff that they kind of hide and keep from themselves because it it really did feel like you were a fly on the wall in that room and it felt so organic. Did you did you shoot a bunch of footage with a bunch of different options and end up using select pieces? How did you think up those lines? Like, where did that come from? Well, um, the stuff that's scripted is like the lysine, <laughs> and you know, like, and me running away. But the unscripted is is Holland saying, "Come sit by me. I'm immune," you know, and that's that's the fun part about you know. That's the gifts that actors bring to a part and to a show um, that I always say, you know, if, if you, you know, particularly me, I'm acting in it, I'm directing it, and I'm writing it. So if I get a, a concrete idea in my head of the way I want to hear something or the way I want a scene, um, I would never be making a show like this, you know, uh, because I've been in... Uh, on the other side for uh, 40 years when a director has something in their head and you, you know, you're in a recording studio and you do 30 plus takes. And I remember doing an animation session with M. Emmett Walsh. Anybody here knew Emmett? The bet, did he give you a nickel? One of the steel nickels? Um, so Emmett was in the session and the director was like, finally after like 30 takes, he said, say it like this. And M. Emmett Walsh, one of the greatest actors of all time, he goes, I'm just a parrot. <laughs> and that's what it feels like when somebody just wants to hear what they want to hear. It, it just, it's the most unsatisfying way of working in this kind of medium, so... Well, you've also had scenes in, in previous episodes and previous seasons where you're leading kind of an acting workshop and you're actually talking to working actors and, and kind of, you know, either giving advice or giving specific commentary on those scenes. Uh, I'm curious from Felicia's end, like, what it's like to kind of cast those and find actors who are, you know, at least somewhat talented at being good when they have to be good and be bad when they have to be bad. And then on your end, like, what you want to bring to those scenes that's speaking to more than just the characters in that moment. It's speaking to an audience of people who might be interested in acting. It's always fun. It's so fun to find people to play bad actors. You have to be a really good actor to play a bad actor. <laughs> I'm really good. Um, we saw so many people for that. And then the rest, we filled out with the people that we cast in those parts, which we kept mixing and matching what they would be doing. Um, and we tried some sort of stand-up people for some parts and a lot of actors for the other parts. And then we used a lot of people from acting class, from, was it, it was Leslie well, Kahn's acting my, class. One of my best friends is Leslie, Leslie Kahn, and she's got an acting company. And so I was like, Lester, send me everybody that you think. And so she sent me every single person <laughs> Yeah, and they, we just used them, and they you threw them lines. Some of those people were not supposed to even, you know, have any lines, and we ended up giving them. I lines always upgrade. Play. Yeah, my line producer hates me. I'm like upgrade, 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 but um, that was fun because I remember asking one of the one of the people like, who wants to like run an exercise? Because I wanted to see the movement. You know, I had that that projection of uh it's not drew barrymore it's the young jenna rollins in the back and having the actors just go ah, and and all of that stuff so um one of the girls was like i'll do it and and you know everybody was game it's just it, it's so fun and exciting to to be in that kind of a situation so god those were those were great really fun you should do it right now Want to run it right I now. know! <laughs> She's ready. Uh, we'll do it after. 
Well, I mean, that could definitely be part of the Q&A session, so we'll, we'll work that into that. But, um, uh, Felicia, when we talked before, one of the things that you wanted to bring up was just um, kind of how the relationship helps the show overall, especially in terms of Pamela's directing, because, like, I've been lucky enough to be on the sets, and they're a really special place to be. Like, they're 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 so, in, like, inviting, and you feel so safe, and it's this environment that seems to bring out a lot from the actors, even when they're, you know, not even that aware of it. Could you talk a little bit about what you've learned over the years of working with her and what that experience has been like? You want water? I do. I have, oh, I got two. I'm good. Um, it's the thing I say all the time. It's that people don't understand. I've never worked with a director like Pamela. I mean, there's nobody in 30 years of my doing this that is just so, she curates every moment everything from the extras knowing their names to every single actor feeling comfortable knowing i mean the crew of course is her family because she sees them every day but even new actors coming in by the end of the day they're family again as well and every i mean look there's our friend right there kute and he was part of the family he's still part of the family so that is just amazing but she has this memory and her vision most directors just show up and they're like where's my here's my shot list Blocking, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not just blocking. It's like thoughtful. I just remember being on the set myself one time and remember with Rebecca Metz and we wanted her in a, you wanted her standing there and I stood in for her. How would she lean with the glass of wine? I mean, it was just like every single thing is thought out. Everything you see is is thoughtful. It's not just like, and none of it just happened. Um, and maybe some of it does, does sort of happen in the moment when she's directing and she's like, oh, now, you know what, let's try this and look at how it's looking now. Look at how that light changed or however that could happen. So for an actor to be in that, I mean, in my, again, my career, I've never heard from so many actors reaching out to me, thanking me to be a part of this set. Even as small as their part is, as big as their part is, they're all just saying like, it was the greatest experience. I mean, Mark Feuerstein got my number and called me crying, saying it was the best experience he's ever had in his life and everything he's ever worked on. And it's just, there's a freedom and there's a safety to the freedom that you don't get on any other set. And I mean, yes, we shoot episodically. We cross board in a crazy way that some days you may be shooting four episodes in one day, but it's all, everyone has their moment to shine. No one walks away going like, oh, I could have done that better because she sees it. She sees, she and she gets performances out of people that are, we have a lot of novices on the show. We use people, this year, an example, we had David Cho playing a Postmates guy and um, who was DJ Suede playing the guy at the party store. The remix guy. Yeah, the remix guy. I mean, like, because she, these are, these feel like they would be really in that part in her real life or that in everyone's life you would see that person because well, they she asked works. to be in the show <laughs> <laughs> but even when they don't ask to be in the show we end up <laughs> well uh, in the get and get lit those were real get lit kids and um the teacher yeah was the real teacher chris champa and he was my daughter's teacher in high school and i was like you got it buddy but I think a lot of that comes also from working with kids a lot. All you know, they're not really trained. So if you can work with kids, I feel like you can work with adults who are not really the the strongest actors yet, and sort of get a performance out of them. So it's just it's really fucking hard. But <laughs> thank you very much. Also, I just want to say to you know give you guys nuggets because I feel like I want to be of service here at all. So what you were saying, when people come in and they even have a small, tiny thing, and I'm like, is she going to do it? Is that going to be okay? Everybody like has an opportunity to score. So there's this one scene in the monster movie and the little girl who plays my daughter and we're in the car and it's me and Alex Desaire, who, by the way, is like my Mercury players. So he was my Jamaican cab driver in season one. He's the, my husband in the Dodge commercial in season two. And then he's my husband in, in the monster movie in season three who pukes. Alex Desaire from Swingers. <laughs> so, 
um, the greatest thing is that the mom of the little girl comes over and she's like, are you? Okay? I'm like, dude, come here. Your daughter's getting asphyxiated. And she comes over and she's like, you okay, princess? Yeah, she's okay. She's okay. And she turns back and I'm just like, yo, just turn back and look at, and I, every time I, I see it, I crack up and she scores. Like I remember her face in this yellow shirt and it's this one little moment and it's fucking worth it. And then later, the dr- I'm looking around, and she's like, no, we're fine, we're fine. <laughs> it's not too much, it's just perfect, right in the pocket, she scores. So it's, it's, it's an honor for us when people take the smaller roles that aren't necessarily have dialogue um, because uh, they could spin something out of it. Isn't that true? Yeah. And they can return for many seasons after. Exactly, and get cut later. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the monster movie too, because again, like that that plot line in season three is is so important and and interesting, and you bring up so many issues that you know uh, people kind of talk about in the outskirts, but also feel very specific to the industry. And one of my favorite parts was just the the decision that Sam makes to actually speak out, like to actually confront somebody. And um, I felt like in those episodes, you put such a weight on that. It wasn't as simple as just deciding to. It wasn't as simple as just you know, uh, waking up one day and being like, I've had enough or building to a breaking point. Like it was, you understood or Sam understood what she was going to do there. Yeah. Um, who, who, who are you hoping to connect with, with those scenes and, and why were they so important to fit into this season? Because like, again, they, they, they're reaching such a wide audience and yet they do feel specific to like an industry audience like this. Yeah. Well, even her ghost dad is like, yo, chill, don't be a whistleblower. And she, y- you know, I, For me, it was important because I have been working as an actor since I'm 12 years old. And so I have been every form of, seen every form of power abuse, um, been, you know, I mean, when I was 15 years old, a director asked me to drop my towel, you know, and uh, I mean, I was pulled up through a ceiling in uh, one movie that I did, uh, told that it wasn't a stunt and I um, there was a hole in the ceiling and I the director the night before I took uh, he took me to dinner and he said you're not doing a stunt and I'm like I'm really nervous about it and he said you are there's gonna be one guy pulling you up on the day he showed me I was on a harness and this one guy pulled me up and I literally was going like this slow like eh, eh, eh. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. And when it came time for the thing, there were four guys who pulled me up. They pulled me up so fast, I didn't go through the hole. I broke through the ceiling with my head. I was knocked unconscious. All the skin off my arms was torn off. I was in a foreign country. I was 21 years old. And then later, I, I, you know, I had said something to my agents and they said you shouldn't say anything and I was given a stunt fee a stunt adjustment which I'm like what the fuck is that they gave me like six hundred dollars for almost becoming a quadriplegic so you know I and I for years would you know meet when I was in my 20s I would compare notes with my friends and then when I became older I would say to younger actors don't ever put yourself in a situation where you think you're going to get hurt or be compromised in some way. So this was like my kind of next thing because, you know, Me Too is about sexual harassment and all of that. There's so much more that goes on. And, you know, you see the shittiness and the other actors treating you like shit and then the directors who are just inconsequential. You know, this director in my monster movie in the show was not a bad guy. He was just a nothing. And then all the other shit goes on. Um, So, you know, it's it's just you you need to make sure that everybody's safe. Shooting this this sequence alone was unbelievable. I was white knuckling. It was the second week. We were in the Inland Empire. It was 105 degrees. I had the most amazing, precious Doug Jones in prosthetics, my monster, 
And I was like, oh, fuck, Christian Doug Jones is in prosthetics. I don't want to be the one who killed Doug Jones. So for like weeks before, I was like, we need cooling tents every single half corn, like every other tent. And we need the these things that my kids wore to soccer every year, these cooling towels around their neck. I was terrified. Stunts, pyrotechnics, pod cars, all my crew... Um, that was the the second week, the first four days. And when we got through that, I was like, oh, I'm really glad we did that early on. <laughs> because it, but there is a way to make sure that people are taken care of. And if you, uh, you can smell it when people aren't being taken care of. So uh, this was my homage to just saying something out loud. And also I've done this. <laughs> I yelled at people. <laughs> So, mm. uh, well, I think it's time for the the audience portion of the Q and A. Uh, SAG is so great because you guys actually write these questions down, and then we get to go through them and, and pick out some of the best ones. And the first one here is from uh, Sabrina Azul. I apologize in advance if I butcher any of these names. I'm sorry, but um, as someone who suffers from anxiety and depression, I truly admire how honest and open you are on your show. What advice would you give someone who's following in your footsteps? Oh my God, that gave me anxiety just hearing it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Woo! Sabrina! I have anxiety. Yo, I got you, bro! I have anxiety all the time. You know, I'm just... <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling that, that I did not really understand that I had until you know in the past decade and um it's it's just something that you know I would say in the last episode of this season uh it's called shake the cocktail uh, you have to do that and change your surroundings you know um and uh be the person because there's not going to be somebody next to you all the time it just Fucking pick yourself up by the back of the collar. You know what I mean? And take yourself outside. Do something different. Change your environment. Um, you know, because you could get caught in these traps. And, you know, depression is something that I, I you know, I go through. And I have this amazing... Uh, Life, thank God, toy. I have this show. I have my children, but two of my daughters just moved out in the past month. I'm fucking depressed, man. <laughs> and so it's like a real thing. And also, uh, don't watch the news <laughs> and don't look at Twitter or social media. I mean, do you do that? Did you put that down? Yeah. You didn't put it down. That's bad. I would say get rid of that. And also, be, you know, try to, try to do other things besides the one thing. This is something that I've been telling people a lot is that I used to wait for the phone to ring or just look for acting opportunities when I was, you know, a teenager in my 20s and whatever. And I, I, I kind of wish that I didn't wait so long you know, because in my 50s, this is happening for me now. And there's just keep yourself busy and keep doing other things. Keep doing projects with your friends. Um, is that what is, was that what her question, did I help? <laughs> Fuck. I feel like that was good advice. Yeah, I feel okay. like that's, that's, that's pretty solid. Questions. Yeah. We're done now. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, the next one comes from George, um, no last name, just George. Uh, whoop, whoop, right? Oh, good. We're getting, oh, George is here. getting a lot of front rowers. This he good. wants in on season four. I can feel it. <laughs> George is breathing uh, down my neck already. Okay. Well, he was smart enough not to put it on the card, but um, the, the comment on the bottom says, brilliant depiction of the human experience. That is the greatness of your show. Um, and he wants to know, what is the challenge, if any, in directing yourself? And do you watch playback to watch your own performance? Well, I have to watch it because I got to look at the frames. So I'm setting up the shots and then I just like go like this over my neck or my face. I'm like, oh, fuck. Oh, 
Ah. Okay, she's good in it. He's good in it. Ignore the lady in the front. Um, so I try not to, but you know, um, the the greatest thing is, uh, you know, it's not just me making the show. I have I have a crew. So my my first AD will come over to me and she'll say, I need to speak to the director, Pamela, now. And I'll be like, right. And we set up shots and we make decisions about the day. We plan the day. And then my script supervisor, Babette Stith, will come over to me and she'll be like, I'd like to speak to the actor, Pamela, now. <laughs> and then she'll like take, it, take the script and she'll be like this. She'll be like, did you want to say this? And she'll point at all the lines that I didn't say. <laughs> or she'll just say, um, are you acting in this? And I'd be like, oh, copy. <laughs> copy that. <laughs> and then you got to adjust and actually start not sucking <laughs> in the scene. That's good. I mean, it, it's, it's nice that you've reached a point where it's just it's, flipping it's, a switch. Where you're like, just not sucking anymore. Exactly. Like, that's all I've got to do it's in this scene. Shake the cut. you got to get like a... Clear. You know? Oh! I'm here. It used to be when I had to show her some auditions or something and I'd have to go to the set, she'd go, only if you'll read lines with me. <laughs> <laughs> don't you guys do that? Yeah. You like go to lunch with somebody and it's like, hey, what's up? I don't know, can you just look at this uh, while we order? Can we just, just say it. It's, it doesn't matter if you can't do it, it's fine. Just. Just say the words and whatever, and then they do it, and then you're like, you know what, actually, it's okay. <laughs> That's gonna hurt me more than it helps me. So, let's just order. I'm always on the receiving end of those requests, so that's good. You are, yeah. yes. Uh, well, Brandon Byrne, uh, this, he has a question for uh, both of you, which is, how has the casting process changed, and what's it been like now that we're meeting more people in Sam's world? So I guess as the show's kind of continued to grow and we're seeing more sides of everything she's going on and, and everybody she's dealing with, um, how has that changed uh, your process? I mean, why are there so many actors in it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. We had a lot of older actors this season where we were casting a lot of people who were in their 70s and above, which is, and then the seasons before, there was a lot of younger kids for the kids. So I got to work with, you know, bringing in a lot of older actors, which was really interesting. And I mean, from, you know, um, um, Charlie. And Charlie Robinson. Robert Robinson and like having that whole day of all of those men reading and then the Esther women. And I mean, we had a lot of older actors this season. So I got to spend a lot of time on that. That's really hard because we had to kill our darlings. Like we fell in love. It was like we wanted to cast everybody. So it was just, uh, you know, we ended up you know, getting Charlie Robinson for, for Sylvester. And I had been in a show called Night Court with him when I was uh, 18 years old. And and when, on the day on the set he came, I was like, do you remember me? And he said, of course I remember you. And, um, and then we cast Bernie Capel, Glenn Turman, Mary Jo Catlett, and Nicholas Coster as the Altacockers. And that was that was heaven. And Glenn and Nicholas were in inner city arts together 50 years ago. It was like the first integrated theater in California, if not one of the first in the country. And they both, you know, Nicholas said he's done 28 Broadway plays since then. And that was the, the uh, ultimate time of his life. And another fun Better Things thing is that I had already shot the scene with Frankie and I reading Raisin in the Sun to each other. And Glenn it en it ends up telling us that he grew up with James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry, and he originated the role on Broadway in Raisin in the Sun. And I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> it, was, it, it was unbelievable. He said, yeah. And then when they made the film, he came here a year later and he'd grown a foot and they were all like, that's okay. <laughs> no. Aww. Yeah, amazing, huh? Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Well, to follow that up, we've got Laurel. Um, aside from the obvious reason, which I'm not sure what it is, uh, but how did you get started in voiceover work? That's not for me. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, you know, I started out doing um, radio, just all ads, and uh, I got this campaign for Seven Eleven, and I did it for years, and you know. Um, Somebody had heard my voice in something, and he's, he's still my agent to this day. I'm with CESD. Um, and he, he brought me in, Paul Doherty, and he said, just read this copy here. And I was like, that's for a boy. I don't want to read that. <laughs> Even though I've been a boy, like, my whole career. And he's like, just trust me. And so um, I booked that campaign, and it was... Uh, so for years I was able to do all this radio and then I was so fascinated because I got wind of animation and I lusted after it. I was like, that's what I want to do. And I I think one of my first uh, voiceover jobs was Rugrats and doing a guest star in Rugrats. Um, and from then on, I you know, I'd just be there and I'd be like watching Cree and EG and and Kath and everybody would be like, I want to do this. And I kept doing more and more. And then somehow, I, I, it just everything happened for me there. But in between, I couldn't pay my rent. I couldn't, you know, I could not last. My rent was like 860 bucks. And um, I had to borrow money. I had to sell my fucking record collection to Aaron's on La Brea. Do you guys remember Aaron's? Oh, sneaking Sally through the alley. My records. But um, then I started scoring in animation. And then I couldn't get a job in radio and ads anymore. It's some. It's weird. It's like either one thing or the other. But, you know, thank God. Anyway. Um, well, I think I've got a good one to close on, but before we get to that, I just wanted to ask if you had, um, if you had any sort of advice that you, that you want to give out for casting specifically now, like how things have kind of changed and whether, you know, with everybody kind of going more on tape, um, less people coming in person, uh, what, what's kind of a, just a general sense of advice you want to give to people uh, so we can help fill out uh, this kind woman's notebook a little bit uh, more before the end of the night? I'm just, I'm not a big fan of everyone having to tape when casting is here in town. So that's just something I haven't subscribed to yet. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm in the room like with everybody. That. Yeah. Get so, in the room. Get in the room. And like, don't say no to anything. I mean, try everything. Even if Never it seems be small. offer only. That's the yeah. stupidest fucking thing you could do. Everybody, I would say 90% of the people who you see on our show have read for it. And we've had some really well-known actors come in and read for parts and not get it. Not because they weren't great, but maybe they just didn't fit into it right. But maybe we use them somewhere later. Um, yeah, just every opportunity you have, get in front of people. If you get self-tapes, make them really good. Um, try not to spend any money on it. <laughs> Find a casting director friend to put you on tape. That's what I do all the time. Um, but uh, I hate that people are asking actors to go spend money to put themselves on tape. It's just making me crazy. You should never, never, never spend money, never, you know, buy something or whatever. Just, it's literally just like, put your phone, uh, you know, against a candle and, you know, <laughs> and just fucking concentrate and make it not sound tinny. And, you know, and if you can get somebody to read with you, amazing but um yeah i mean that th that's a, that's a huge thing get, get in the room you know we've had so many people who say offer only and we're like oh they'd be great and we see offer only and we're like no i mean henry thomas um who played robin in the show he read and i was like and, you, and they <sighs> everyone reads cold for us there's not even giving people sides in advance so yeah and sometimes it's a lot of material. <laughs> that was yeah. a couple of scenes, yeah. All right, well, uh, last question here is from Roel, and she wants to simply know, uh, why is your show called Better Things? Oh, I'm sorry, because Roel, he wants to know. <laughs> sorry, Roel. Hi. <laughs> 
Um, because I I like things that sound hopeful and positive, and um, I've always wanted to name like something better things. And I all I also the Kink song, you know, is my inspiration, and so. Um, I always thought I was going to use the kink song and then I got into the John Lennon Plastic Ono band song. But I like it to be positive. I don't like it to be like, we're dying or <laughs> I'm boring. I like it to be better. Th it's like it's like a good toast. Better things. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Family Adlon and Cleve Chano for being here. Thank you, Ben uh, Travers. Enjoy the night. Ben. Watch better thank things. You all.